Yo, 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 check it. Welcome once again to Movies That Piz Out. I'm the Kizernal. Let's see what's popping off in theaters this week, yo. Straight out of Compton and straight into the multiplex is the story of the hugely influential rap group NWA, which stands for, of course, just Google it. I'll wait. Directed by F. Gary Gray, Straight Outta Compton is a whirlwind tour through the late 80s and early 90s rise and fall of N.W.A. A story marked with street violence, police brutality, shady business deals, gang feuds, and raw, unbridled talent that would change the world. And when I say it's a whirlwind tour, I really mean it. The history of N.W.A. and the subsequent aftermath is a story so ripe with potential one could easily fill three or four movies with it. And in the end, maybe that is what should have happened. There are moments in this film that crackle with intensity, especially the live performances of N.W.A. and the depiction of police brutality as a galvanizing force for the group's most incendiary music, which unfortunately has become as timely as ever. But in an attempt to service every aspect of the group's legacy, the film spreads the narrative too thin, which results in a great experience for existing fans, like a companion piece to augment what they already knew, but for those going in blind and just expecting to see a biopic with a well-told story, well, you may leave the theater a little dizzy and a little confused. That's it for the summary. Let's get in depth. Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, Easy e and some other guys as well. The story of N.W.A. is a great jumping off point for telling any number of side stories. The censorship of the music of the mid-80s, the Rodney King beating shining a light on police brutality, the rise of gangster rap, East Coast versus West Coast, the insane Suge Knight saga, the popularization of hip-hop in the suburbs, the AIDS epidemic, Ice Cube's writing and acting career, and the subsequent rise of Tupac, Snoop Dogg, Bone Thugs and Harmony, and Eminem. There is a lot of fertile ground here, and the movie does its best to at least pay all of these things at least a little bit of screen time, but it never gives any of them the proper breathing room. There just simply isn't time. The movie starts by introducing us to the main members in brief vignettes. Dre getting kicked out of his house, Easy e slinging crack rocks, and Ice Cube writing rhymes on the school bus. These early scenes don't quite set the tone before the movie whisks you off to an early formation of the group and the first gigs together, and now we're off and rolling. You see Ice Cube's lyrical and vocal prowess early on. That's O'Shea Jackson Jr. playing his own real life father with an eerie sort of authority but I wish I would have seen more of Dr. Dre developing as a producer, how he became adept at the sampler, not just the turntables, we see a little bit of that, but we see him magically coax a vocal performance out of Easy e in this early scene that I just didn't quite buy. <laughs> All right, you're you trying to be funny, but you see how you said that shit, right? Like you believe it? Yeah, I believe that shit. Then say this shit like you believe it, man. Like it's a motherfucking Sunday and you cruising down Crenshaw in a motherfucking 6 4. Come on, say that shit like you believe it, man. Like it's your words. Feel that shit. <laughs> Stop playing around. Loosen the fuck up. There you go. <laughs> cruising down the street in my 6 4. Oh, shit. Hey, that was dope, eh? That shit was dope, man. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, man. I'm sorry, I don't believe that Easy e was coaxed into being a legendary rapper that quickly or easily. I do believe that rapping, like singing, is a natural talent and it's a skill that can be honed over time, but not in the course of this 30 second scene. I also don't believe that Ice Cube and Dr. Dre, who were millionaires by then, drove their cars through the LA riots as they were happening. I don't believe that Snoop Dogg just opened his mouth to spin rhymes and the very first verse of Nothing But A G Thing Baby 
just came out verbatim just like it is on the record on the first try. These are all convenient inventions for the movie, dramatic license and all that, and it's fine. But the whole movie does that as if to say, we're going to give you only the information that you need. Then you fill in the blanks because there just isn't enough time and we've got a lot of ground to cover. And they do cover a lot of ground quickly, if not exactly efficiently. I'll give the movie this. For two hours and 27 minutes, it sure isn't the least bit slow. I realize at this point that the review thus far seems kind of like I'm panning it, so let me make this clear. There is a lot to like in this movie, and there is even more to like if you are already a fan and already know the story. Like, if you saw a big bald guy with a bushy beard show up smoking a cigar, and you immediately thought to yourself, Oh, that's Suge Knight, y'all! It's about to get real up in here! Then you will find enough to enjoy in this movie. The main members of NWA turn in blazing performances, especially young Jason Mitchell as the doomed firebrand Easy e He is a pleasure to watch and makes what could probably be seen as the only true character arc in the whole film simply electrifying. It's fun to see what pop culture icon is going to show up on the periphery next, such as a scene where Ice Cube mentions offhand that he's writing a script called Friday, or when a skinny kid named Calvin shows up at Dre's studio. If you need some help, he's also conveniently wearing a hat that says Long Beach across it. And look who they got to play Tupac. I mean, he's only in there for one scene, but he is so convincing that I had to check the credits to make sure they didn't sneak a hologram in there on us. My only complaint about this movie is that I wish there were more of it. I mean, a lot more. So much more that I think a feature film is the wrong medium to tell this story. How about a season or two of television? I can see a much better version of this story playing out for three seasons on HBO. You could give attention to the parts of the story that were lacking in this movie. You could give more weight and context to some of the characters that don't resonate here, such as the respective women in the rappers' lives. Their relationships, which are just hinted at in minor scenes, would be far more meaningful in a longer format. And Suge Knight. Suge Knight. If the legends are true, Suge Knight has the potential to be a cinematic villain on par with Hannibal Lecter. But here, because there's not much time to devote to him, he just kind of comes off as a bit of a caricature, and he has to share the role of the movie's heavy with Paul Giamatti. The entire time I saw this movie, I kept wanting to peek in the margins and linger a little while before getting shuffled off to the next key moment. And then, as the credits rolled, it dawned on me. Because on screen was archival footage, playing over the credits, old interviews, concert footage of the real NWA, other aspects of the group's legacy, some, some blurbs about the headphones, Beats by Dre, and then a snippet about Eminem and Tupac, and it struck me. There it is. There is a great documentary to be made about NWA. But straight out of Compton, as a movie, I'd recommend it for fans, but it's definitely not a musical biopic on the level of Ray or The Doors. I award Straight Outta Compton a medium bag of popcorn. If you're a fan of the artists here, like the majority of the people who applauded at the end of this screening, then you may be happy just seeing your heroes portrayed on screen and portrayed well. But you won't learn anything new. Alright, that does it for this episode of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to click the thumbs up if you liked what you saw and subscribe so you'll never miss a review. I'll be back with more reviews of the newest releases, so stay tuned. I'm not going anywhere. Boy!